everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC Fight Night Vittori versus Cannoneer card from a DFS perspective. And tomorrow we're going to be doing the betting breakdown, which is more of a contrarian take. And we really did well with it last week, actually. We had a couple of pretty decent long shots. Um, the other thing, by the way, to give you guys a little bit of preview, um, next week is when I go for the big uh, live final prize. Um, now, unfortunately, I'm not going to actually be there live. Um, just like just because I can't make it, but already um, this Emmett versus Tapuria card, they have at least they don't have salaries out yet, but at least they have uh, at least they have lines, and I've already taken a little bit of a look at it. I'll go through it when, when the salaries come out. But you see, there's a next week you have Ilya Tapuria is like a three to one favorite in a five round fight, and you have um, uh, what's his name, Trevor Peak, who's like minus two fifty. And he's probably going to have an inside the distance prop of about minus 200. And then you'll have Tiara, who's probably going to have, he'll probably be 9,400 also with, with a whole bunch of submission and grappling upside. So uh, it's going to be uh, an interesting, uh, interesting sweat. And I will go over how I, I can't go over the actual lineup, obviously, because I can't risk people knowing what I'm doing. But I'll definitely uh, talk about it to some degree. What I actually might do is I might do kind of a, um, Max Steinberg did this for uh, one of the live finals. I think he did it uh, kind of like a lead up to the to the building of the lineup thing and then didn't release it until after the event ended. Um, I, I, I found that actually pretty, pretty useful. So maybe I'll do that. Um, anyway, uh, we'll get to that next week. But this week we have uh, Vittori versus Ken Neer. And at least for now, it's a 14-fight card, which is awesome. Uh, and you know, there's, there's, you get a little, uh, you get a mixed bag. You have some really, really strong fights that you want to target. You have some fights that you might want to fade. And as usual, what's going to determine the GPP winners is what happens in those other fights, you know? So we're going to go through it. And, uh, I don't know exactly how I want to attack this, uh, breakdown. Um, so let's, let's actually start with the fights that you know that you're going to want to target. Okay. Um, so right off the bat, let's just start with Nicholas Moda versus Manuel Torres. So as far as the money line goes, like minus 180 versus plus 140, there's no real, um, money line value here. I mean, they're, they're priced where they're, where they should be. As far as money line goes, you have Moda 7,300 Torres 8,900. And I guess that's somewhat reasonable as, you could say that you give a little bit of line value to Moda, but it doesn't matter. Like the real, the real thing here is this inside the distance line. I mean, these guys are going to just go, go after each other. I mean, it's minus money to go under one and a half rounds. I mean, fight inside the distance is like minus 400. I mean, someone's getting KO'd here. So um, this is a fight where you're just going to have to play. If you want to play just one side of it, I mean, you could do that, but if you're going to play multiple lineups, you definitely want to play both sides. Um, and implicit in that is if you are going to play one lineup, Moda is certainly a live underdog because when he wins, I mean, he's he's probably going to get a KO and at 7,300 getting a KO, most likely in the first round, is just going to smash. So th this fight, you're just going to want to play both sides of this going to want to get exposure now it's going to be really popular but i just don't think you can avoid it if you want to know the truth so i mean you can but but i think this is the first fight you have to kind of start with so let's i keep wondering the best way to do this so let's let's put both these guys in so we don't forget and then we'll go back to it all right the next fight i guess in no particular order um so let's look at because i think there are three of them i really want to target maybe four so Sabatini, Lucas Almeida. So th this is a little bit, it's not exactly the same because although the pricing is similar, so you have Sabatini, he's a minus 180-ish favorite and he's priced, what, about 9K? Let's take a look. 9,100, 7,100, which is reasonable. But the thing is, is that even though he doesn't have a good um, inside the distance prop here, at 9,100, you're going to want either, right? And here's the key. You want to have either an inside the distance prop of about minus 110, meaning, you know, uh, Sabatini inside the distance, like should be probably minus money. 
and you're not getting that. But the thing is that his path to victory is so DraftKings friendly because of, of his wrestling, you know, uh, and, and because of that, that, that swamps and overwhelms this semi pedestrian inside the distance prop. I mean, he's got just an incredible ceiling if, if he gets his stuff going, where even in a decision, he can score over a hundred points. And if he gets like, if he really gets the fight he wants, where he gets takedowns, 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 and then gets the submission, I mean, he can really smash. So he's, he's a target, you know, he's definitely someone you want to target. And then you have this sneaky other side of this. You have Almeida, who his inside the distance prop is about only plus 230, which is really, really, that's more of what you get out of a pick em fighter. Um, and he's only 7,100. So essentially, whoever wins this fight is going to be in business. As a matter of fact, I would actually say that it's more likely that the Almeida win puts him in the optimal than an out Sabatini. Because Sabatini could win a kind of a wrestling match where he just holds him down and doesn't really get any of those significant strikes and maybe only get like 90 or 95 um, or maybe even less. But I don't see the, the variation where Almeida wins and doesn't make optimal. So I actually think that if you had to pick one of these, I think Almeida was probably the better if you had to pick one. But you definitely, I, definitely I, I'm pretty sure you want to pick somebody from this fight. Okay. Um, and then the other one I wanted to talk about, there's actually two more. Um, one is Alexandra Costa versus Jimmy Flick. So you have a minus 250 favorite. So I imagine he's like 9,400. And as a matter of fact, he is 9,400. So 9,400, 6,800. So at 9,400, here's the problem, is that you're, you're really going to need a, a, a first-round finish, okay? If you don't get a first-round finish, unless you have a lot of grappling upside, you, you got a big problem. And for a first-round finish, I mean, you, you're going to need to have an inside-the-distance problem, probably like minus 150. And let's see what he has. Uh, cost inside this is like minus 120. That's pretty good. I mean, it's not a complete lock or smash or anything like that, but when you see the lack of inside the distance props for a lot of other fights, you'll see why this is a probably a priority. Um, and the other thing is that the flick inside the distance at plus 350, I got to it's it's not nearly as good of a play as Almeida, for example. And I it's not nearly, I think, as good of a play as Moda. Like you look at Moda here. Moda's price, well, he's a little bit more expensive, but you look at Moda's inside the distance prop, and Moda inside the distance is, I mean, what is this? Moda inside the distance, like plus 160 or, no, 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 like plus 200 or something like that. So, I don't know, may, maybe this isn't such a, a must-target fight as I thought, but it's definitely, it's definitely up there. You know, I, I would rank them as Torres, Moda, top, then, boy, which is a better fight to target, the Sabatini fight or this fight? I think it's pretty close. I think it's pretty close. But I think those are the three that, you know, that stand out as far as inside the distance cross. When we go through all the other ones, you're not going to see anything resembling that, uh, with one exception, which is kind of a, another discussion. Well, actually, let's have that in the discussion. So Armand Sarukian is a minus 1,000 favorite. Um not only that, but his inside the distance prop, he is probably like minus 200 to finish inside the distance or something like that, right? Yeah, I mean, he's inside the distance like minus 250. So that's all great, okay? But 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 the, the thing is, is that his price is 9,800. And listen, good on, good on DraftKings for doing this, you know? Um, this actually, it puts a, you know, it makes it difficult to play it, you know, because remember, this is not a game about, about plays, this is a game about lineups, you know, and even if, let's, oh, let's take it to the extreme, right, so it's 50,000 in salary, if I told you that he was going to get, this is a, probably a stupid example, I'm going to do it anyway, let's say that he was going to get 300 points, which is 
not possible, right? But let's just say he was going to get 300 points, but his price tag was 49,000. You know, would you play him? Hey, yeah, it's pretty, pretty good price, but you know, it's pretty good, 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 good ceiling, but you have to pretty good score, but you'd have to fill out the rest of your line and you wouldn't be able to do it. Okay. Um, so at 9,800, I mean, he's got to really deliver. Okay. Now, and, and this is an important thing to, to, to grasp about DFS and in general. Armand Sarukian's projection is going to be the highest. And the reason why is because his median or his mean is going to be the highest. And the reason for that is because he is going to win more often than anybody else on the slope. Okay. So all of his scores are going to be like, not all of them, most of them are going to be good. Right. So when you average them all, you get the highest mean. Or even when you create the median, you get the usually the highest median. Okay. But follow me here. Sarukian's ceiling is no better than some of these other fighters. You know, like um, in a win, Manuel Torres can score just as many points as Sarukian. Okay. In a win, Moda, for example, can score just as many points as Sarukian. In a win, Almeida or Sabatini, all these guys can score as many points as Sarukian. The only thing is, is that they're just not going to do it as often. Okay. So, so that it's important to remember just because he's 10K, just because he's 900, just because he's minus a thousand, just because median is the highest, doesn't mean that you should play him, right? Because you're only going to get one score. Okay. You're not going to get like all of the scores. So it's really important to, to, to identify this. Sarukin is just a play. You know, he's probably going to, I don't know, probably going to finish in the first or second round. And, you know, he's either going to get one takedown and then a KO or no takedowns and a KO or, I don't know, maybe one takedown each round and then a, and then a finish or something. If I told you that he was going to get 120 points, for example, would, would you take it? And you think about this. You know, 120 points is tough to do, and he's not going to do it every time. But even if I told you he was going to get 120, would you take it? I mean, maybe, probably. The quick answer is it depends. Depends on what the rest of your lineup does, right? Or what the rest of the, everybody's lineups do. If you told me that I was going to get 120 out of Nicholas Moda, you told me I was going to get 120 out of, out of uh, Lucas Almeida, you told me I was going to get 120 out of Emmanuel Torres, I mean, I would snap it up, right? And therein lies the difference. Um, so with respect to the Sarukian play, you know, you, you the, the good thing about the Saru, about Sarukian is you can get him in, you know, because we already identified two, you know, very, very high scoring and live um, underdogs in Almeida and Moda. So you could play all three of these guys together really easily and, and fill out a really, really good lineup. And if you get lucky with Almeida and Moda, Remember, you think about this. They're, they're both about minus 200 or plus 200 to, to, to finish, which means, what's that, about 30% of the time? So that means 10% of the time, both of them finish. And that means that, you know, 10% of the time, you're, you're in, in an optimal city, and then you can play Sarukian along with them, who's going to score about 80, 90% of the time. So about, you know, what's that, 8% of the time? you're going to have optimal, you know, if you play these three guys. And that's pretty good. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to win the whole thing because maybe other people will have the same construction. But but that's what makes Sarukian playable is the existence of two really, really good, you know, possibilities. Now, if either of these guys lose, like if Sabatini wins, for example, regardless of whether he does that, then, then I mean, listen, you could do this too. You can play Sarukian Sabatini but you're probably going to want to play one of those underdogs, like either Almeida or Moda alongside of Sarukian. Because if you just play Sarukian along with kind of like a pedestrian underdog that's not going to score that well in the win, I don't think that's going to be enough. You know, you really want to compare him with the high upside underdogs. Um, okay, so we talked about Sarukian. We talked about the key fights. 
Uh, next one I want to talk about is the main event. So you have Vittoria against Cannoneer, and it's it's all right. The fight rates to be about a pick 'em to go to decision, and it's a five round fight. So what does this mean? Well, they are going to get the benefit of those five rounds more more than the knockout artist would. Like if you have the two guys that rate to knock each other out in the first two rounds, their projection is really not going to be helped by a five round fight. But when you have guys like this that throw volume, they're not really the greatest finishers. Their their score is going to be benefited by the five round fight. They're both going to be pretty popular as all five round fights are because they're going to just project as a good median. Um, the, the, the one thing though, is that only one of these guys would, would make, uh, I'm only afraid of fading one of them. Okay. And that would be Vittori. So because Vittori's ceiling is just really, really high um, because of his grappling upside. Now, the, 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 there comes with this a lot of caveats, and the caveats stem from actually, you know, fundamental fight research and things like that. So let me just get into that a little bit. If in fact you knew that Vittori was going to just just go for takedowns, then he would be just an elite play because he's kind of have a floor. He's also got an incredible ceiling. Okay. Um, and he's put up, you know, 150 points when he has gone for takedowns. However, in his last couple of fights, he is not really committed to that. So if he gets involved in a five-round kind of striking fight with Cannoneer, number one, he might, you know, it might not be the best thing for him. And number two, this whole fight might kind of bust. Okay. So I think that that. Given the fact that it's going to be owned, I'm inclined to just fade the Cannoneer side. And I'm worried that fading the Vettori side is just going to be bad news. Because if, in fact, he does get it going offensively with the grappling, I mean, you, you, could, you could be missing out on 140 points. And that's something you just don't want to do. Um, considering that he also has some finishing upside, you know what I mean? Not, not a lot, but some finishing upside. So for the main event, I'm going to recommend that you either play Vittori or nothing. Uh, and then, again, people are like, well, that doesn't help me. Should I play Vittori? Uh, I honestly don't know. In, in main event, in the, in the MMA, yeah, you should play him. One lineup. I mean, I will say this. If you play Vittori with Saruki and with the two underdogs, you're probably getting a little bit too chalky now. Um, so that's something to consider. But, I, but Vittori is definitely the better GPP play. Just because you you just don't you just have that possible ceiling. Now again, if it turns out that Vittori is sixty percent owned and, and, and Cannoneer is thirty or something like that, then okay, then it's probably you can probably fade Vittori at sixty percent ownership. And a four, fourteen fight card, I don't think is going to be that popular. I mean, it's going to be popular, but it's not going to be like sixty percent. It might be thirty five or something like that. So I don't know. Uh, def but definitely, Vittori does possess the better ceiling. So I definitely think he's the better GPP player. All right. Um, let's let's get to a couple of fades. Uh, take a break. Actually, let's let's start from the bottom. We'll work our way up for the rest of these fights. So first of all, Bukakskis uh, against Palga. So we're going to talk about this in the betting breakdown a little bit differently. But the, for the purposes of DFS, I mean, this fight's kind of bad. You know, you have. Let's take a look at the at the pricing first. So Bukakskis is like minus two hundred. So you're expecting again to see like a you know eighty nine hundred something like that. 9K, 7,200. And remember, like if, if you're going to play a 9K fighter, I mean, he's got to have an inside the distance prop of about pick him or have grappling upside. And, and Bukakis does not have that. Um, his inside the distance line is what? Uh, like plus 300. I mean, that's just terrible. I mean, as a matter of fact, I mean, I, I would rate Pauga as Pauga's like plus 350. He's sort of like Jimmy Flick, right? Um, he's got the same inside the distance prop as Jim as, as Jimmy Flick, which is actually so, sort of interesting because I think Flick is going to get ownership, um, where Palga won't. So, that this is actually the Palga side of this is a 
pretty sneaky little bit of leverage here um, in case people do play that Jimmy Flick play. Um, however, Jimmy Flick is cheaper. Okay, maybe it's not that great. All right. So in any case, this, fight, this fight is probably just a pass. There's really no grappling upside here. It's just kind of a bad fight. So Ronnie Lawrence versus Dan Argetta. So this is kind of interesting because you have you have two wrestlers. Um, I shouldn't say that. So so Argetta is basically a pure wrestler, and Lawrence is more of an overall fighter who's used wrestling, um, and that's actually kind of important. Um, you, you are not going to see a good inside the distance prop of either of these guys. Uh, let's look at the price first of all. Lawrence minus one ninety. So I guess eighty nine hundred something like that. If we look at that again. Ronnie Lawrence, 8,700. So it's kind of cheap, all right? Um, but here's the thing, and I've never really done the research on this. I wish somebody would, would, somebody would. Whenever you have two wrestlers, what I've heard from a lot of content providers is that the wrestling tends to cancel each other out, whatever that means, and that becomes more of a striking battle. Well, I would suggest that there's there's two ways this could go. Number one is that, yes, that, that could be the case. But number two is that when one guy relies on the wrestling and the other guy just happens to be better at him at it, then it could be like a real smash spot, okay? Um, the other thing, with, which is kind of interesting, is that Ronnie Lawrence in his last fight got ragged on, Okay. And he himself got ten, you know, got taken down ten times. So maybe there's a little bit of recency bias against him um, that's affecting the line a little bit. So I I think that 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 variation B is very relevant. Uh, that uh, that if in fact Lawrence is just a better wrestler or can you know is just a little more well rounded and Argetta can do nothing, then I think Lawrence can end up getting an enormous score. However, if I'm going to be consistent, you could say the same thing about Argetta, right? So if Argetta is just is a better wrestler than Lawrence, and Lawrence just doesn't believe it and wants to get into a wrestling match, next thing you know, you could have Argetta with, with, two, with four takedowns, two rounds of control time, and get a decent W at 7,400. Um, even still, I, I'm still not convinced that score is better than the than the than the uh, Almeida wins or the uh, or the Moda wins. But I think that this fight is probably listen. This fight could bust. <laughs> it really could. Uh, I, I think that if the fight does bust, though, I think Lawrence gets the win. You know, I don't think Argetta is going to win like a striking battle. You know. I, I think Lawrence could win a strike, but I don't think Argetta can. So I think that the three variations are Lawrence smokes him. Argetta gets a, uh, you know, is a better wrestler and scores 80 points, which is good, not the best. Or Lawrence just wins a striking battle and scores 80 points or 85, 90 points. Or something like that. So I guess overall, maybe this fight is kind of a pass. Well, I mean, that's so nasty to, to fade a fight like this with so many so many takedowns available so i probably will just probably play a little bit of both um and i guess just because of the ceiling of lawrence i, I guess lawrence just has to be like you think what if you're organa and like you just can't do any wrestling in this fight i mean you're gonna get obliterated so i think that lawrence is probably the better play i'll probably be with the field with him um and i'll be probably with the field on Arcana also all right, uh, Teresa Bleda versus Gabriela Fernandez, minus 250. So I'm expecting like 9,400 or something like that, 9,300. And you're getting 9,500 on, on women's fights. That's, that's a, uh, that usually doesn't work out too well. Um, and, and the reason why you're getting this price is it's kind of a combination of MMA math, recency bias, uh, Grappling, all the things that just combine to confuse people. And and what we're looking at here is that Blada in her last fight was against Natalia Silva. And she was extremely competitive. 
Uh, she won round one with a takedown and a lot of control time. Um, and then after round two, kind of sort of ran out of gas and Fernandez, not Fernandez, and Silva got her in the third round. But Silva went on to win again. I mean, so Bleda has this kind of, you know, recency bias and MMA math thing going for her or against her that she just had a good performance and that performance was validated by the opponent having won. In addition to that, you have this style matchup where you have Bleda, who apparently, you know, she's, she's good with takedowns because we just saw her take people down, someone down, against Fernandez, who is apparently has poor takedown defense. Um, however, I will say that Fernandez does have better striking than Bleda. And I have to say that at 6,700, who's to say that, that Fernandez just doesn't, doesn't beat Blade up on the feet if Blade can't get these takedowns? Um, so this is kind of gross, but I, I just have this feeling that, that Fernandez is even a better play than, than Blade is. I and mean, Blade, listen, she's probably going to win. She's minus 250 favorite, probably get takedowns, but 9,500 is just a, it's a rough price, man. It's just a rough price. Um, you know, let's say that Blade gets a takedown in the first round and submits her. How many points is that? 105? 110? Is that that great at 9,500? I don't know. So this fight's not going to be a priority for me. Uh, I don't think Blade is going to be a priority for me. Uh, I am probably going to get a couple of sprinkles on Fernandez, though. All right, uh, Bunez versus Zuma Gulov. Uh, this is probably a decent-sized fade, but we'll take a look at it. You have uh, Bunez, well, Zuma Gulov is minus 170, uh, actually minus 150 with big, and being priced relatively reasonably, 8,500 versus 7,700. And with respect to the inside the distance prop here, it's ex I would imagine it's extremely poor. Uh, Zuma Gulab inside the distance like plus 450. Boone is inside the distance plus like 350. Just, it's just not good. You know, this is just this is just a decision fight waiting to happen. You want a narrative? Okay, the narrative is that Zuma Gulab has lost basically every split decision. So he's now on a mission that you know what? Screw this. I'm just not, I'm just never going to decision again, even if I have to lose. So he might just go all out for a finish here. Which listen, if Bunez, listen, there's also a possibility that Bunez is terrible. You know, we don't know who he is, and he hasn't fought anybody good. Um, so if if Zuma Gulov can actually just just put it on him, um, because he feels he needs the finish, I think that's pretty good. I, I actually prefer. And we'll, we'll you know we'll talk about that. When we do the betting breakdown. But I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a preview. I'm definitely betting Zuma Gulov inside the distance, um, but. Um, yeah, so I guess Juma Gulov's a decent play. And I think that Juma Gulov's his, his, his reputation for losing all decisions and for just losing every fight um, is going to make him not very popular. And as a matter of – and for that reason, I don't think Bunez makes particularly good leverage. So I think, if anything, I'm going to take some Juma Gulov here and uh, very little, if any, of Bunez. All right, Denise Bondar versus Carlos Hernandez. So, right. Bondar is a minus one thirty, so I expect him to be about eighty, yeah, you know, like eighty five hundred or something. And whoa, wait a minute, Hernandez is eighty three hundred and Bondar seventy nine. Wow. All right, so we got like a pretty sick line value in Bondar, and not only that, but but if you believe his regional tape. He is a uh, – he's got wrestling. This is a this is a tough play to fade. Now, I have heard some narrative stuff that – not narrative stuff. Like he did get his arm broken by, by Malcolm Gordon, who's a two-to-one favorite. He looked pretty bad before that. And I have heard that his his competition in the regional scene was really poor. But it's just kind of hard to ignore the, the style matchup. It's kind of hard to ignore the line value. So Bondar is a tremendous player. Um I would I would consider this kind of a core play actually. So, let, let, what what minus one thirty at seventy nine hundred? It's not like and it's not like enough where he's going to be played by everybody. You know, 
I think it's a really nice, solid play. And from what I heard, Hernandez a takedown defense is no great shake. So I, I don't know. I, I think Bondo is a very, very strong GPP play, strong cash play. Um, the only thing to keep him off, you know, keep it not make it not be a great play is that maybe he's going to be really high on. But we'll, we'll, I don't know. Uh, I've heard a lot of anti Bondo speak the last couple of days, so maybe ownership will be pretty reasonable. And I'll I'll take the line value. I'll take the rest of the upside. Sounds good to me. Uh, Kang versus Quinones. You have Quinones minus 160, so expect to see about a 8,700 again, same type of same type of deal. Let's see. Uh, yeah, 8,800. So 8,800, we wanted inside the distance profit about a plus 130 or so. Let's take a look, because neither, neither of these parties have any particularly great wrestling upside. Kang, maybe a little. Quinones inside of distance plus 230. I mean, that's not that great. Kang inside of distance is just awful. So this pride fight is probably a pass. If anything, maybe take a shot on Kang, maybe because of a little wrestling upside, but I'm not going to bet on Quinones and DFS with that inside the distance prop. All right. Uh, moving on. We already did Jimmy Flick versus Costa. Uh, Jaime Barcelos versus uh, Miles Johns. Okay. So Barcelos is a minus 200, so we're expecting to see about 9,100 or so. Let's take a look. 9,300. So it's a little expensive for his money line. Not that bad. But for 9,300, we're going to need, you know, wrestling upside and probably and a minus 110 inside the distance prop or a really good inside the distance prop. Because it's not like Barcelos is a big wrestling machine. He's got enough, but he's better have an inside the distance prop probably without picking here. I don't think he does. Like Barcelos inside the distance is plus 200-ish, plus one. Yeah, this is this is not going to be really good. Um, and Miles John is he's just he he's offers nothing as far as his inside the distance prop is plus six hundred. Doesn't really have a lot of wrestling. So this fight is probably going to be somewhat of a pass for me. You have Muslim Salikov versus Nicholas Dalby. He's another minus 200. So expect to see again around 9K. And that's what we're getting, 9,207 K. And again, it's, it's it, at, at 9,200, you, you need it inside the distance prop of better than pick them, especially considering Salikov is not, doesn't have any wrestling at all. And if you look at the inside the distance prop, Salikov is just um, is just very pedestrian. Let's see. Uh, Salikov inside the distance is plus 200. That's just not going to be good enough. And I don't think he's going to be really popular, which is why Dalby is probably not a great leverage play either. You know, so Dalby's inside the distance prop is probably, I would say, plus 700. Let's take a look. Yeah, inside the distance is like plus 700. And it's not as if he has a lot of wrestling either. So this fight's going to be probably a pass. Moda Torres, we went over already. Sabatini, we ran over already. We already went over uh, the main event and, and Saruki and Silva. So let's um, finish off with Christian Leroy, Leroy Duncan versus Armin Petrosian. So you have Leroy Duncan, Christian Leroy Duncan, who's minus 140. So we imagine he to be about an $8,600 guy. Let's take a look. Um, yep, at 8,600, right on the nose. So for 8,600, you probably need at least... Well, I mean, too. if you give me a plus 200 inside the distance prop on the favorite or wrestling upside, we'll talk about that in a second. Leroy Duncan fight. Uh, where is this? Leroy Duncan inside the distance plus 200. All right. That, that is reasonable. Okay. So I am going to consider him uh, unplayable at plus, uh, at plus 200. That's actually not bad. Uh, the other thing is that Petrosian does not have the greatest takedown defense. Now, even though Duncan is not really sh shown it off, uh, if he decides to go that route, that could just add to his ceiling here. So I definitely think Christian Leroy Duncan is definitely in play. Um, Petrosian, he is inside the distance trap. is extremely poor. He has no wrestling, so he is a toss. So let's, uh, let's review. Um, I think the main event, I think Vittori or nothing is probably the best play. Uh, Sarukin, sure, if you can get him in. Leroy Duncan, I like him. I don't like Petrosian at all. I think the 
Almeida Sabatini fight is a key fight. You have to play both sides. I think Mona Torres key fight. You have to play both sides. I would fade Salikov Dalby. I would fade Barcelos Johns. Uh, Costa Flick. I would play both sides. Kang Quinones probably fade that one. Hernandez Bondar. I think Bondar is an elite play. Zumagulov uh, Bunez. I would play uh, Zumagulov but no Bunez. Blader Fernandez. I go back and forth. Really, I, it's probably only for one fifty match. It's probably the best idea. It's probably just to fade it. But I'll probably play a little bit of both. Um, maybe, maybe I'm playing on a Plata, Plata. Maybe just a little Fernandez. Uh, Got to play a little bit of of, of both sides of, of uh, Lawrence and Argetta, and probably end up fading the Bukakis fight. If anything, maybe uh, a, a a a low totally zero own dart throw on Pagua. That would be a that would be a big one. Like if he can. He's got everything going against him. He just took Jordan Wright to a decision. Um, yeah, so I don't know how he's going to get it done, but eh, so he's plus 350 inside the disc. It's not that bad. That's pretty bad. It's not that bad. So that's going to do it for the DFS preview. We're going to do a, a, a betting breakdown tomorrow, which is obviously a lot of fun. And until then, uh, good luck.